Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is session 69 in the series of Libraries in Response. Uh, we're now nearly three years into this uh, series with uh, quite a few sessions under, under the belt and uh, recorded and archived for your review and share. Am, am I sharing there? Uh, no. no, sorry, got it. There we go. Got it. Okay. So session 69, uh, libraries and AI, boon or doom? Thank you, David. Very, very clever alliterate, nearly alliteration there. So we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. Um, we've been producing this since the, the dawn of the pandemic as, okay, what what do libraries do about this crisis? And that has just rolled forward into what do libraries do about a number of challenges and crises. And 2020 was a, an extraordinary kind of cascade of a health crisis and a social crisis, political crisis, economic crisis, and uh, of course the the granddaddy, the the climate crisis. So we've we've dealt with all of those, or we've tried to talk about all those, and and how libraries are dealing with them and what they might be dealing with them. And so we've collected quite a bit of useful uh, stories and information that are uh, stored on the uh, libraries and response page at giglibraries.net. The session today is hosted and recorded by IFLA, the International Federation of Library Institutions and Associations, based in The Hague. At the helm is the head of public policy for IFLA, Stephen Weiber, a longtime associate and a good egg. Uh, our series sponsor is the Internet Society with their correct uh, URL here. We've, we've had a typo in the past. Uh, uh, their principal interest has been around low Earth orbit satellites and how those extend library services, library digital services, uh, and, and both uh, to enhance connectivity at remote libraries and also increase resilience in communities having a near impervious connection, broadband connection to the Internet, regardless of what kind of events happen on the ground is extraordinary. So uh, they're not focused so much on artificial intelligence, but we want to give them credit anyway, and we thank them very much. Uh, our speakers today are uh, David, Beth, and Sue Young, who will hold forth on how uh, this new, uh, well, we'll call it emerged, semi-emerged, and I don't even know what to call it. It's like a fish trying to describe water, as it were. It seems so pervasive and touches so many different things. It's really hard to to talk about it in some context, <clears throat> but we're going to try to do that today, particularly as it relates to impact on, on libraries and their services and all of us, their patrons. Uh, it just This is just in the last couple of days, these articles have just blown out. This is the arrival of, of ChatGPT from OpenAI, uh, actually a startup. Uh, compared to the monstrous uh, companies that have been pouring billions and billions into this for years, Google, Facebook, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and a range of others. So these are all, you know, fascinating takes on this, on this topic. The fact that 100 million users have signed up for this uh, chat GPT within two months is, is record-breaking. It is extraordinary. It, it signifies an interest, you know, a public interest that is, say, unprecedented. Well, what is that? What does that mean? And, and what does it mean to the libraries and their services? We'll hope to find out some of that. Uh, this is our, we did a prior session on AI and libraries. Uh, we keyed off of a paper by the Urban Library Council on the very, this very topic and touched on some of these uh, a couple of years ago, uh, but things have changed and they're changing rapidly. And so this we're, we're picking this up today in an effort to kind of articulate the various issues that are relevant to the world of libraries, which of course is a large world, uh, and then lay out or map out a progression of sessions that we can keep keep this conversation going. So I'm going to turn this over to David 
who is returning with us. Welcome back, David. And David will uh, lead us out and moderate uh, the discussion. And you're all welcome to uh, weigh in. Well, David can set the rules for engagement, but uh, certainly the chat is wide open for anything you would like to uh, put forth. And we will just see what we get. So, uh, <laughs> David, uh, thank you for uh, appearing here. And Beth and Su Young, also welcome and uh, take it away. Thank you very much. And, and I like that. Uh, we'll just see what we get is sort of the my modus operandi for just about everything. So um, first of all, I'd like to thank Don for 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 really being the impetus and organizing this and his patience with me to get this up and running. Uh, let me just set a context because the goal here really is a conversation. But I wanted to talk about sort of what we're thinking about with this conversation and introduce then um, the folks to sort of stimulate it. And absolutely, please use the chat as we're going. I assume we can do the whole hand raise thing and um, we'll bring you in and really want to be a conversation. So the angle of this, I also want to be clear in setting some expectations. The angle of this really is looking at how libraries and librarians are going to be reacting to AI moving forward, not the technology side of this necessarily. We're not going to spend a lot of time on large language models and Markov models and how semantic scraping and such um, directly impact chat GPT, which is an interesting moment. It's an interesting moment because from a technical level, it is not necessarily a giant leap, but from an impact level, at least in the consciousness, it is because it's the first time that AI has been shown directly to interact in a human-like way in the sense of constructing things that we thought was really pretty safe in our domain. Now, you scrape that, you look at all the articles that are going out, you find some pretty serious issues. You find things like it does a great job of writing good text, though it may be based on really bad information. Um, we see things that um, it's, you know, you can get multiple viewpoints out of it. Also, the construction of ChatGPT was the idea of scraping millions and billions of documents that are out there. And so if you write a blog, if you've done a Facebook post, et cetera, there's an excellent chance that your text and your work was used in training ChatGPT. And I'm guessing you didn't get the email asking permission to do that as well. Trillions. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Um, so bottom line is we're going to talk a little bit about libraries and library education, but not so much on what it would take to adopt, but more on the idea of impact. And so I've invited really three people. Um, uh, Sue Young Ray, Dr. Sue Young Ray is the Associate Dean of Education and a full professor here at the University of Texas High School. Uh, and she has done some fabulous work on this through an IMLS grant and convening, particularly in academic libraries, talking about it, but really giving a sense of some initial discussions about specifically how librarians are talking about and interacting uh, in this area. Uh, and Beth Potan is joining us from the, who is an assistant professor at Syracuse University's iSchool. Um, and I've asked Joe James to get up very early. Thank you, Joe, uh, who is a uh, associate professor at <laughs> the University of Washington's high school. So we got lots of high schools here, but that really what I what I looked in why these would be really interesting folks is once again, Sue has done amazing work in AI, but she's also done really great work in information retrieval, the idea of turning information retrieval into education systems, how that can impact and think about system design development. Um, and as an associate dean for education, what that looks like for student demand and what are librarians, what kind of courses do we put together? And so I'm going to ask her specifically about the IMLS work here in a moment, but that was sort of these other benefits coming with it. And that, I asked um, Dr. Potan to join us, not because of her amazing coding skills. Um, I asked Dr. Potan because the work she has done in, um, in indigenous and marginalized knowledge system in epistemicide, as she talks about, but the really the social impact. Um, what does it look like when people are scraping and using this? What does it look like? Um, how do we support folks that may not have normal access to anything else and chat GPT might become the only thing they have access to get human-like responses. So from an equity issue, 
things of that nature. And she's also has a background in school libraries and can talk a little bit about those kinds of terms. And I asked Joe Janes um, because Joe Janes is someone who always makes me think. Um, and he's done work not only in sort of the role of documents and how documents help us think about our place in the world and how it impacts society, but I'm actually going way back and talking about that one of the things that I, Joe has, I, I think a, a fundamental contribution to the field that is these days might be often underlooked, but the Internet Public Library, when he and Marita Holland pulled a group of students together in Michigan and said, hey, this internet thing's interesting. What does a library look like in that environment? And not only did it turn into interesting conversations, it turned into real service. And it turned into a global network of librarians thinking about moving ahead. And so the question I'm gonna ask Joe, get you ready for it, is if you were to do that today and think about you know AI and such, how does that, how would we even play with that? Not necessarily what is the impact, but how can we play with some of those ideas? So that's that's what we that's what we're setting up for this conversation. And so um, and I really want to invite you to be participate. But I'm going to start, if I may, uh, Sue, if I could ask you to tell us a little bit about one, the IMLS grant that you did. But if you could start with why you felt that was necessary, what was it that led you to that? And then talk a little bit about the grant and what you learned from it. Okay, so um, thank you so much for having me. And um, so IMLS is Institute of Museum Library Services. So this is a, you know, like a federal agency that supports a lot of library programs, libraries, museums, and archives. So um, this, uh, what's called IDEA Institute on AI, IDEA, uh, Institute. So that stands for innovation, disruption, inquiry, and access. Um, so this is a basically continuing professional continuing education program for librarians. So David want me to talk a little bit about you know like how we end up doing this kind of work was there when we you know um started having some conversation with the librarians they really want to know more about you know these kind of questions right you know how ai is going to really change library services what are the real implications of sort of ai where to even begin but then when we look around and there is like you know all this like a conference one hour session where this expert to sort of show up and then talking about it and that's it right so everybody agreed that it this, yes, it is important. Yes, this will really, you know, have a significant um, impact for like, you know, libraries and the librarians, but the kind of like programs are very short term. And then even though there are some um, conferences, new conferences such as uh, AI for LEM, I will put that one here, like uh, AI for LEM is one conference and there is also fantastic uh, futures, you know, this kind of like conferences, but again, as a person who doesn't have a lot of, you know, background in AI and most of librarians are like that because we, when, uh, you know, librarians were educated, there, there was no such curriculum, right? But then you go to this conference and then these experts sort of talk about it. So we just did not have any mechanism where librarians feel comfortable. And then it's okay that you don't know much about AI. We are all here to learn. So we wanted to kind of build this such a community. Uh, with you know like uh, uh, those people who are very passionate about this interested in and they're willing to learn even some very basic python all the way to the sort of implication so i think that we were sort of trying to fill in that gap that a lot of people talking about other a lot of people want to learn but there is no really great training program so i think that that's how it began do you want to talk a little bit more about what's in it, what we did, or okay, you are you are muted. Uh, David's yes, naughty. That, was, that was great. So, what did you do in response to this? Thank you. So, what we did was that we, you know, wanted to make this as a, you know, a national program. So, we uh, sent out the call to a lot of mailing lists and then invite people that if you have a, like even very little idea about, you know, 
what you want to do and then what is seems to be possible in your library and then you know trying to join this one week long intensive uh education program that runs in actually in person during the pandemic um, and then so on. So, so we actually, then we realized that one week may not be really enough. Um, like 45, 45 hours, it starts from like a Sunday all the way through Friday. So what we end up doing is that, okay, let's start with some sort of onboarding program. So before they actually uh, get together in 2021 at University of Tennessee and 2022, uh, University of Texas and Austin, uh, we actually ran kind of weekly onboarding program about six weeks. Okay, so they like, you know, about two months before, so people already started a meeting and then we created like a mailing list and then they recovered some of the basics so that they can start thinking about what kind of project is going to be possible for me to actually, you know, apply and at least even try in my library after the institute is over. So we started brainstorming a little bit and then really try to build the community of practice there and then in July in you know like for the past two years we kind of got together and then um from almost 8 to 5 30 <laughs> there was a really intensive program what I want to sort of emphasize was that we are very careful that this is not about coding this is not really about machine learning, although we had to cover those. We really started talking about, you know, like what's going to be really impact of this, you know, like a lot of people are talking about data, uh, data bias. We actually even watched the movie together, had a lot of discussions. We also spent a lot of time um, talking about how to even start this kind of a new project. You know how to present your idea to your stakeholders or you know your boss so we end up sort of talking a lot about project management skills you know how to put the team together and then really trying to talk with the people uh about how to move forward when you have an idea you know how you kind of you know get more people to join your initial idea. So we talk about um, project management uh, skills and team building skills and so on, uh, along with, you know, those ethical implications and so on. So we talk about that at the end, you know, actually everyone um, has a sort of showcase it's like, you know, 10, 15 minutes of when I go back, this is what I want to do. Okay. So it, we, uh, and then people got really excited about it. Those of people who had a similar idea end up talking more. So that's a kind of sort of activities we, uh, we did in one week. <laughs> then after that, we actually kept this mailing list, you know, going. So that uh, we encourage them to sub, like present their work in some of the conferences, some of the workshop organized by ACIST. And then um, like we actually invited people to present in ALA. So we are sort of trying to help them to continue and share their ideas for the next a few months. So the institute itself was, yes, one week long, but we really trying to have a lot of activities over almost a year. And then interestingly, that mailing list is still going on and people are exchanging interesting projects somebody else is doing and, and, you know, what kind of a conference and workshops are coming up and so on. So I think that that's what we did. That's fabulous. Um, I'm going to come back to you in a moment because I there part of, of this was how do we get librarians to sort of up to speed and ready to work with these projects? But I also, once again, I'll come back in a second because I know everyone's going to have a, a suggestion yes. on okay. how I'll do we but bring- Before we- Oh, yeah. That they... Yeah, I just want to acknowledge that this is a collaboration project that I work with uh, Professor Tania Biral at University of Tennessee, and then Clara Chu, at, uh, she is a director of uh, Molteson Center for International Library Programs at University of Illinois. So I just want to <laughs> give them a credit because we really work together and it's not just me who uh, organized this kind of institute. Well appreciated, well appreciated. So once again, I'll come back in a moment just to put it in your mind of talking about 
how we build bridges from say the computer science side of things to the library science things. Um, so, which is sort of an iSchool question, but it's also, I know that led to another IMLS project, but hold off on that for a moment. Beth, if I could turn to you for a moment um, and ask you to think out for us. So, so a lot of the scraping of documents and the training of these language models sort of deals with what's on the internet. And a lot of the questions about how do you mitigate some of the problematic things on the internet? But I'm really interested in, in how you may think about the fact that these tools are not being trained on what's not in the internet, right? The idea of, you know, are we seeing other populations where we don't have the kind of documentary evidence and information? And do you think that's gonna have an impact in how these tools are used and can affect communities? Yeah, so this is a great question. And I, I think the answer, it's a little bit of both, right? And, and my concerns lie in both of those places, both in how these kinds of tools are going to replicate what is going on in our world without the kinds of critical examination that we need, especially if we're looking to increase equity and diversity. And then I think on the other side of that, I'm very concerned that our voices who have been historically marginalized and intentionally left out of our discussions or folks that are not included in our archives, if we have not taken the care and the time as information professionals to keep those documents, digitize them, make them available online, then of course those voices aren't gonna be part of the conversation. So I, you know, when I think about these things, I think about the lessons like that Virginia Eubanks taught us in automating inequality. So we know communities that are getting heavily policed by AI systems, how that is working out and how often that um, leads to bias against people in low, lower socioeconomic statuses or people of color. And then I think about Ruha Benjamin's work around racist robots and, the, and, and Sophia Noble's work on um, algorithms of oppression. And so what I'd have us think about as information professionals and especially as librarians, how do we bring that critical lens to help people understand whose voices are represented, whose voices are missing? And I would really challenge us as uh, professionals who are gonna embrace AI and research it to really think about algorithm reparations. And what I mean by that is a systematically looking at whose voices are not included and making sure that we take the time to sample extra in those areas, make sure that we are going out and adding some of those documents so that those kinds of conversations do become part of the chat TPGT language. So I, I think that, that that those are my initial concerns, Dave, is that one, we are gonna see the kind of biases that are already existing in our space replicated through these algorithms. And we know that to already be there. And at the same time, it's gonna to continue to exacerbate um, the gap in voices of who gets represented because it can only mimic what we put into the systems, right? And so if what we're putting into those systems is already biased, we are gonna see that replicated in these systems. So it sounds like you, you've got a couple of things when specifically around the library community. One is the idea that we actually do hold this sort of treasure trove of cultural information, but if it's not available, and we'll get to the ethics of scraping and permission in a moment, but let's just pretend that it's all happy, happy, that right. if those materials are not kept and not made available, not only are we potentially de depriving people of research in their history, we're also potentially leading to skews in the training of these AI systems that are going to then continue marginalization, continue misrepresentation um, within different communities. Is that a, a fair statement? 
Yeah, I, I, I think that that is an absolutely fair statement. So, you know, I am from Alabama and I think about my family's history in Alabama. So my dad was the first black person to desegregate schools in the state. But if you go to our state archive in the Department of Archives and History in Alabama, there's only one document in the state archives that talks about my dad and my grandfather, and it's not even about them desegregating the schools. So if we, let's say we're building Alabama archives algorithm, then we're scraping that data. Well, one of our major stories about desegregation and equity during the civil rights movement is not going to be there because those materials have not been collected. And so for me, I know you said we talk about corrections later. For me, this means that I have to train librarians who are going to be aware of um, these kinds of issues and understand these kinds of gaps as they're presented in our collections and also challenge them to think about, you know, while chronologically might be a great way to, you know, add to your collections, we also need to understand the cultural relevance from other communities, which might escalate the care we have with certain items and getting them added to our systems sooner than later. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of the State Library of Virginia that digitized the papers of former governors and just happened to skip the first African-American governor of the state. Now right. that information isn't available when you're building this. Can I, can right. I jump in on that uh, uh, a second? Uh, Beth, interesting, uh, fascinating perspective, and of course, uh, uh, inbuilt bias on information in general. Uh, you make me think of kind of the larger bias of, of the Internet, and that's English. So yes. a lot of people, you know, that wouldn't prefer English as their first you know, interaction with all this. And so it's even a, a bigger, larger kind of uh, inbuilt bias, especially when we're talking about the entire Internet and every paper, document, anything that's ever been digitized, which I was just reading this morning, looks like it's going to be a problem when it runs out of all, everything. I mean, everything has been written and digitized. It run The models run out. Then it, right. this article I've posted at the beginning of the chat makes the point that, well, then they will start generating their own training materials and train themselves off of that. It's it's iterative and, and just mind boggling as well as terrifying. Sorry, but uh, uh, no. I look forward to this, this uh, reparations or corrections uh, part of the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that that is really important for us to think about. And of course, you know, the privilege of like English as lingua franca and the language that everybody goes to is one of those injustices that we see all the time. And so especially if we're looking at like tribal communities using English names to describe the tribes rather than the names the tribes would use themselves, right? We see we have long seen those kinds of inconsistencies with how we catalog information. But I think that librarians, you know, understand the responsibility of curating information, although we need much more training in terms of critical race theory and how we really understand these gaps and how they have worked to marginalize communities so that we can correct it. But I do think librarians have those skills to start adding to the computer science language to make sure that we are considering these kinds of gaps, these kinds of injustices, so that we're not just replicating them in a new space. No, well, fortunately, I, I'm in Texas and we've solved all those problems. Um, <laughs> yes, so, of course. <laughs> Joe, I'm going to pick on you for a moment. And actually, I'm going to, I apologize to, that I'm, I'm going to ask you a question I didn't say I was going to ask. Um, I, I am a great lover of the podcast you did around documents that change history. Um, and I remember you coming into my class and you sort of declared yourself a documentalist. And I don't know if that still exists, but um one of the things I'm interested in, these are document models. They're, in other words, they were training things on you know, things that have been documented, whether it's someone's rant on a blog, whether it's whatever the notion is, they're sort of points in time. And, and I'm wondering, is that going to be, while that might help with language, does that sort of limit the kinds of information it might know, more implicit knowledge as opposed to things that become tacit? and documents, or is that too weird of a question? 
Um, well, of course, it's a weird question, but I'll, I'll give you a weird answer, which may not in any way respond to the weird question, but uh, we all know each other long enough to know that's what I was going to do anyway. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Seattle up here in the upper left hand corner where the sun is just rising and Dave owes me for getting me up at the time of day when the sun is just rising here. Um, the yeah, So listening to all of this and, and thinking about all of this, it, it does, um, uh, you know, as someone who has studied among other things, um, documents and how they got the way they are, uh, you know, why particular particular documents and also documentary forms and things uh, took the shape that they do. They do that, uh, you know, all of those things emerge for a set of reasons, a set of needs, you know, some, we need some piece of paper, we need some record, we need some way of doing things. There's some evidence that the earliest forms of writing uh, were all were and record keeping were all around business because that was the you know trading and bartering and agriculture and so on because that's what the primary need was at the time. So all of these things take on the shape and form they do because of a whole set of of initial starting points, contexts, um, social and political and economic and legal and all kinds of things, and that's still true today. Um, one one question you might ask yourself about documents in the modern world is why the CDC vaccination card was too big to fit in your wallet. And the answer is because they didn't think you'd need to carry it around in your wallet, except we all had to for about a year or so. And now we don't and nobody cares anymore. Um, there's a document story for you right there. What what I think of what I've been thinking of in listening to this conversation is is um, you know Beth has beautifully talked about the inputs and the hugely problematic ways in which right. those inputs um, came to be and how they are and more to the point what's not there who's not there um, what comes out the other side and what comes out the other side is text so far mostly in English so far. Um, clearly they will get better. Clearly they will diversify into other languages, but it will come out as text. At the moment, it's kind of crummy text. Um, it's pretty superficial. It's pretty boring. It's pretty, you know, eh, the sort of thing that students are going to use to write papers and get C's on them, as we all know. And, and, and it's also happening really fast. Um, and our institution has put together a group to think about how we, you know, we might reflect the use of these of generative AI tools in teaching and lots of other places have done that as well. But what's going to come out the other side is text. And it's, and now, you know, librarians are going to face interesting questions like, if that text in some way makes its way into our collections or into our services or into our world, what do we do with that? How do we, do we organize that? Do we catalog that? Do we, how do we contextualize that for users so that they know what it is and what it isn't and where it came from? And how do we talk about who wrote it? How do we cite it? How do we help users, students, you know, in, in school library settings, you know, other kinds of folks in other kinds of settings? How do, how do we think about authenticity there? How do we think about authority there? Um, what do we do with stuff of what we would now say stuff that is artificially created, um, or at least created at second hand? Somebody's created these algorithms, which have then fed off of the the deeply flawed and and uh, Swiss cheese whole version of the of reality that's on the internet, and then stuff comes out the other side. Um, how do we? How do we understand that? How do we organize it? How do we help people to understand and contextualize that? And, and then, you know, does that start to become a substitute in some way for real stuff? All of which begs questions of what's real and artificial and yeah. Um, and and I don't think I don't think anybody has started thinking about that. We're all just too sort of and and there was a piece the other day that Chat GPT got got released prematurely to try to jump Microsoft, who announced a couple of days ago that they were using it to re use these using their tool to revitalize Bing. Yes, Bing. Mm, there's a word you haven't heard in 10 years. Um so there, this is all happening really fast. And and there's all this kind of outflow of cultural product say what you will about it and it's you know got lots of issues and press questions and problems and flaws but it's going to be some sort of cultural product and then it like every cultural product ever in every format including like eight track tapes and you know god knows what all um it lands in our lap 
And what are we going to do with that? And and how do we how do we um, work with it in such a way that it's um, uh, that it 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 serves the needs of our individuals and communities, but also does justice in every sense of the word, um, in the senses of the word that that Beth just talked about, but also you know that actually that 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 gives credit where credit is due, whatever that means, um, and thinks through the implications of you know potentially large slabs of text that no human being actually wrote. So I'm, um, I'm that's a big sorry. one. That, yep. and a fabulous one. Um, in fact, it, I think it, it made a nice transition. Pat put a, a really important point uh, in the text and followed by Laurie yours. So I, I want to make sure I get to them. Um, Pat talks about it says it, it it remembers the the idea of Google in oh, some yeah. way that libraries would be dismissive of it because well it it, it indexes things that may not be true and Google bombing yeah. and such yeah. um and I think that given the three folks here um I don't sense that in other words Joe when you bring up the idea of what do we do with these creations of text I don't think that's the answer of we wait and see or we we don't oh. because right it's the idea we do need to do yeah. this and we need to be well, proactive in that and, um, and, and, and so, so further to pat's point just for a second yeah that's a point well taken i think a better analogy is wikipedia mm. is what do we do about wikipedia you know because that was a that was a punchline for a while um and you know schools banned it and you can't use it and blah 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 and and it has wormed its way into all kinds of things i mean what other encyclopedia is still around sorry and um and and it, it's a thing and we had to work we as as librarians had to work to figure it out in some cases work to try to make it better thank you jessamine west and others who fought the good fight around around the early days of wikipedia you know with mixed results um but you can't just like, hmm, well, that's really interesting because it's happening way too fast. Yeah. And and, um, right. and 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 it's not going to slow down and it's not going to uh, solidify. Sue, you want to jump in? Yeah, so I think that I've been also, you know, a lot of people are talking about chat GPT and I also have been having a lot of a sort of conversation with the people who are in academia as well as those people in the IT industry. And it is really going to change a lot of people's practice so i absolutely agree that we cannot just wait there we have to do something about it so one edge like you know person who is teaching says that he actually came up with a very you know like a new kind of assignment uh that uh instead of worrying about this you know chat gpt you know generate text uh, using uh, chat gpt and then using that document for uh, fact checking <clears throat> how you can actually use the library or other resources to go through this text and then you know what I could do the fact checking and then students come back and discuss how accurate uh, you know those facts were um, so that um, so that's one you know kind of like a way of using it and I also heard from a person who is in you know big IT company uh, she said that like now designers are not start, uh, do not need to really start from scratch they let like AI technology generate initial design but then they sort of go on and then change edit and then same thing goes to the programmer. They don't have to start, you know, like really, you know, coding from line number one. It's sort of a let the AI do that, but then they go through and then, you know, like find the errors and then, you know, make it a little bit more creative and so on. So it's it's gonna that tool is gonna be there, but that kind of go back to uh, you know, HCI researcher Ben Schneiderman's kind of this whole um human-centered AI frame work and then he made it really clear this is quote that you know this uh, algorithms need to be used for user experience design methods to we really need to sort of bring embrace you know user experience uh, research method to shape technologies that amplify augment empower and enhance human performance so I think that um, that also this quote also reminds me my advisor Nicholas Berkin, who recently retired from Locus University. He wrote thirty years ago, "Who's intelligence?" Like when we talk about artificial intelligence, right? We should talk about how AI can help 
people to get smarter, people, you know, make to be intelligent rather than actually humans are helping machine to get smarter and more intelligent. So I think that like whose intelligence was, I think that the title of the paper. And I think that that's really, you know, something we can always think about. Thank you. Yeah, Beth, I'm thinking, and I apologize if this once again, taking you back to your school library days. Um, one of the, the sort of standing lines is that, you know, the scenario is the teacher sends the kids down to do their report on Abraham Lincoln. They pull out the encyclopedia, they copy some stuff down and that's the, the assignment. And the great, valorous school librarian walks in and says, let's figure out how we can make this a better assignment. And I can see that happening at all levels from school to academic to public libraries about we need to rethink how we ask questions. This technology is a prompt to allow us to be more, get to more critical thinking, critical theory. Is that a, a fair prompt? Yeah. So I think, you know, in, in thinking about what everybody has said, you know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about copy theory when Joe Janes was talking and the, you know, and in, in when Buckland gets into this and information is thing. So what is this new thing that chat PTG is going to give us? And it is a really, I'm still kind of wrestling with that in my head because it's a new, is it going to be a new type of information? Is it going to be a new thing we have to keep? Um, I think about in school libraries, my goal has always been to have the kids think more critically and get into those higher, you know, operational thinking skills and, and pushing them to ask harder questions. And often what we see is those easy reference questions that get sent to the library, something we can kind of answer by just opening one document. But what that doesn't give us is the kind of criticality of comparing and contrasting and you know, like we could write a paper on Christopher Columbus using an encyclopedia entry, but what does it look like if we actually are pulling out his diary and his journals and some and, and other writings about him besides like what has been fed to us through Common Core and standard curriculums, right? And so then we can actually have students who are really thinking about raising issues and looking at problems of injustice around their school, whether it be small ones, like why do we have to wear a uniform or larger issues of like, how do we have better water in our schools, right? But if we really work to support um, this, this kind of thing, we actually can have students get into the kind of learning that we're interested in, where it's not just answering questions, but they're really kind of making evaluations based on evidence that is allowing them to have the skills to start working towards solving, identifying gaps, and then solving those problems. So I, I, I do think that it is within our mandate as, as school librarians to be pushing for better questions and better assignments. But what that means and looking at some of the comments in the chat that we as librarians have to be trained to critically do that work. And right now, many of us are not. And so, you know, I look at what I have been able to do at Syracuse since I've been there, which is taking our cultural competence class and our critical literacy classes and making that a core class. And so one of the issues I often see in these areas is that people that want to do critical work have to take those courses as an elective rather than those courses being embedded as the main parts of our curriculum. So I, I would argue that for our school librarians to be able to do that and for our public librarians and our academic librarians to be able to have these higher level critical conversations, we have to be trained in how to do that. And, and that training happens the same way that other academic pursuits happen by reading the literature, by looking back in history and understanding the provenance of how these conversations have grown over time. And, you know, we have to be honest, the time and the budgets, once you're a librarian, is, is not there to do that extra work. So I think that is going to really require us to reframe the way that we educate librarians when we have them at our, in our MLIS programs. And I'm going to use that, and I want to make sure that folks take a look at the chat, because Lori is putting some really fabulous comments. I want to build off of one. So we're in Texas, 80% of the library, uh, public libraries in Texas are smaller rural libraries down to like 15 and 
500 people and 800 people. And the capacity there, you know, we don't have any certification below a population of 25,000 to have people with professional degrees at all. Um, so it's a capacity issue. And and Sue, I'm going to come to you for a moment, uh, I, which was one way to build capacity is to bring in partnerships, obviously, bringing in people, and that includes education. And so what I'm, I hope I'm not sharing a story out of, out of bounds, so I'm sorry, but I, you had mentioned a conversation when you were sort of organizing and thinking about the workshops with someone with technical background in AI and how they were having a really hard time bridging to the library community, that they didn't necessarily understand the environment, they didn't necessarily have the examples, and so they were having a hard time really engaging that population. Can you talk a little bit about that and what it sort of led to with the, the new IMLS grant that we're working on? Yeah, sure. So I think that I, uh, when we were, you know, since like um, Clara and me and then Dania or not are really machine learning data scientists, we had to go out and then recruit instructors and who can really teach, you know, like the application of machine learning techniques in the library context. Number one, it was really hard to find someone who understands the context of the library. Because, you know, they usually get a, you know, degree in sort of a computer science and they were so into, you know, like learning this advancement of like a deep learning or machine learning and, and so on. Then they never had the opportunity to expose to like a library. And of course, when you, you know, talk with like librarians, you know, they know a bit about how to work with other people and so on, we end up having two wonderful librarians from Stanford University, who actually has a first-hand experience of implementing, you know, AI project, but like, so they know a bit about library, but they, you know, like there are some people potentially, you know, uh, eventually who can teach this Python and machine learning, but we just did not have, uh, you know, people who know both context and then you know both the skill set so that was really you know big challenge and as a follow-up we are kind of curious so three of us went on and then analyzed like uh, the curriculum of a 53 kind of you know like a library information science programs and not surprisingly right like a uh, 20 percent of school offer just artificial intelligence without any context you know, 12% machine learning, 7% deep learning, and then, you know, 5% natural language processing. There is nothing about how to design, develop, apply AI technology in library context. So there is a really, you know, big gap we identified. And then, so uh, here in the UT Austin I School, uh, David Lenkis and then myself, and there is another uh, faculty colleague, Ken Fleshman, we end up actually writing another, you know, IMLS proposal, and then we are in year one. So David, you can talk a little bit about our project. Yeah, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit, and, and Joe, I'm gonna come to you, talk about sort of an iSchool context for a moment on, on preparing librarians. Because what we what this I, what does can I loop oh, yeah. back for just a sec? Sorry, I didn't know. Can I loop back to something uh, we, we were talking about money a little while ago? I think Beth was referring to something earlier. So let me just spin this out for you for a second. Um, AI is cheaper than people. Uh, it's expensive to build, but once you build the thing, it's just going to spit out text, and that's relatively cheap. So. The cost of producing AI, generatively AI created text is going to be lower. And, you know, a lot of that stuff's going to wind up on the free internet. So that's fine. But BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed just laid off a bunch of their writers and then miraculously a week later announced that they were going to use generative AI to write some of their basic pieces. So this stuff, primarily because of cost, but, you know, other reasons as well, is going to make its way into what we would always think of as the published record. Um, and not just, you know, stuff you find on the internet, but but things that, you know, I mean, BuzzFeed's a legit source and other things like it. Um, and so, A, how is anybody going to know? Um, and this reflects the general public and reading things like that, but also, you know, students writing papers, people writing, you know, people writing their resumes, we won't go down that road. 
um, uh, the you know the, the 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 there's no way to watermark it. There's no there's no procedures. There's no techniques yet to be able to auto automatically or forensically identify um, generative AI created stuff. Um, a lot of the open source journals are saying no. We're not going to take research articles, journal articles written by this. So they're already thinking about it. But you know, so here's the pernicious part of this is that institutions that are resource starved, like, I don't know, every public library everywhere, might find that it's way more attractive and way more feasible to enhance their collections using AI generated materials. Is that a good thing? Is anybody gonna know? Does that do anything to the nature of the record? Does that reinforce many of the inequities and injustices we've talked about and such? Is that going to be just a necessary financial budgetary decision that people are going to face down the road in a few years? No idea, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Well, and then I get to put my rose-colored glasses on and say, the more that we can automate <laughs> that some is a of recommendation. The, yeah. I just like why oh, didn't oh, I think of that? Why, yes, of course. Um, the the <laughs> one of one of the the things I think about it, and clearly this is where you know the hammers seen everything as a nail, which is the more we can look at. AI to augment cataloging records and et cetera, allows and frees up librarians to do more of the essential community engagement, human to human interactions that aren't necessarily textual. Um, but it's something we, you, we want to think about as opposed to just happening. Um, and one of the, so I'm just going to stop here because the IMLS script we're working on is to prepare future faculty. So they're coming from a data science and computer science background but they're working in an academic, a school and a public library every year on projects. And it's been, even this though we've just done one semester of it, it was astounding, not just from what the, the PhD students picked up, but what the faculty picked up on once you get into data and seeing things like privacy of data versus equity and those things can be suddenly put it at odds. And so that collaboration of having academics and future academics working directly in library environments on these research for collaboration, I think is a, a powerful learning experience. This is nothing new, but I think AI gives us a great opportunity to look at some of that. We have about six minutes left and, and we can talk forever, but I wanna make sure that that folks have, a, if you have questions that maybe didn't show up in the chat that you wanna turn on your mic and turn on your camera and, and ask a question or make a point or share uh, an experience. Yes, please, anyone do. What strikes me is the vastness of this, this topic. It runs so deep. Most of what we talked about today dives deeply into professional considerations and, and academic levels of, of interest and, and possibility. At the same time, this is going extremely wide and popular as, as uh, Joe was making the point earlier on, on Google search people are just using it and it may not be good but people like it and so this is going to change the environment in a substantial way which will in turn inform the needs of uh, professionals somehow yeah i mean we already have situations where um people are forced to apply online for not online jobs so janitors people doing materials and they have algorithms that are how fast do they fill out that form are part of the determinations i just love the idea someone recently talked about creating a uh a, a chrome plugin that can in essence fill out that form very quickly using ai as a way of, of almost balancing some of those things other McDonald's comments or questions fly online from mcdonald's yeah yeah, yeah. So I, 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 sorry, just as a side, right. I actually went into a McDonald's the other day and tried to order something and it had been at least eight years since I'd been in a McDonald's. And I don't mean that as a point of pride. Trust me, I have plenty of fast food. Otherwise, I could not figure out how to order. <laughs> there was no place to walk up to. There were just screens and I was lost. And I'm like, all right, I'm clearly now McDonald's literacy game. deficit. You anyway, any other one of our yeah. concerns about the application of this technology, you know, the last time we talked about big AI, it was in the context of the, 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 the social network manipulation of everybody. Uh, and now when you think about these tools that could scrape everything about each of us and serve up individualized, much more tailored 
manipulative, influential suggestions, uh, it's really causes a pause and and the the trust issue reemerges as ever and points back to libraries as a place people can go and get some kind of guidance that they can believe in because where else can you really go uh, for that? So that that role for librarians to translate this phenomena, I think people are going to be looking for that. Just what does this all mean to us? So the possibility of libraries convening conversations like we're having, well, not, maybe not as, as academic as today, but generally about this uh, technology's impact seems like another opportunity. Yeah. Lori? Um, just, just the discussion here, for me, working at a state library, this is my second state library, as well as being a librarian in a rural and a rural adjacent community. Um, when we have staff, and directors who don't go to library school, who, as I said in chat, you know, they were hired because they were good at customer service at the local convenience store. This is information that passes them by. Hmm. And that is a huge equity and inclusion issue because they're the people that are rural and small communities go to the people that they go to for help and a lot of the information it's too expensive for them and working at a state library you know we try to provide that information but we don't have the funding to train everyone talking about ai in libraries or, or um, books in general <laughs> and Thank so you. <laughs> you know while this 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 is a great discussion but it's it's very much high level yeah and we need to also talk about how are we going to scaffold it and make it accessible to everybody who needs it and, and Lori, so that's what I, you, i'm you sorry push. dave sorry dave in between you know Lori, what you just said and thinking about what don said right those are really where my concerns lie is that we already know we are in the midst of this information literacy crisis in terms of people being able to understand authority and authors we see people sharing articles where the dates where things are like outdated because they're not even doing that like first level of information literacy and so for me i get really concerned in thinking about how much is this going to add to the complexity of those information issues and the kinds of deep fakes and other kinds of myths and dis and malinformation that we're seeing across our communities and how is that going to be able to be manipulated and and utilized for some communities and against others and i think absolutely you know when we are hiring folks who don't understand the power of information, the complexity of information, and all of the other embedded social, economic, intellectual, val cultural values that are embedded in there, we are doing ourselves a disservice as a field because, yeah, that stuff is not just going to miss them by, right? It's not just going to go by their heads, but they're really representative of our public at large who really isn't critically thinking about the kinds of information we're interacting with on a daily basis. So I think, you know, I don't have an answer for you, <laughs> Lori, and how we solve that as an issue, but just to say that, yes, um, I am afraid that this is going to become a larger problem for us. And just to highlight what Subtarshi said too, he must have had an excellent professor, I'll say, um, for his 511 and Introduction to Information Science classes. But I think it, 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 it is not as powerful as we think it is right now, but also it has the potential to grow so much. And we're just going to see that continue to ex escalate and exponentially grow. So I think us having these kind of critical conversations now, and I think to Joe's point, really wrestling with what we're going to do about it as information professionals is really important for us. So I'm going to take that as a last comment. And, and Lori, the good news is I got some ideas of because I think state libraries State libraries are have an essential role to play here, and I think what's great about it is not only does it demonstrate the power of state libraries to do capacity building in rural staff, 
um, but to demonstrate the relevance to the larger public uh, and, and build that agenda. And so I think that deals with certification of libraries and of librarians, as well as how we build those certifications and what we require. Anyway, David, David, uh, yes, Don. Rather than put a close on this, we're okay. this is not a TV show. We're not limited by uh, you know the the hour. Uh, and there seems to be a lot of interest here. What I'd like to suggest is that uh, we uh, put a pause and uh, uh, and ask everyone to unmute because if we were together, as we usually like to be in person, and we had this uh, these extraordinary presenters come and speak with us, we'd be we'd be giving them a, a hand right now. So that's what I would like to do is have extra way to to uh, uh, unmute and give a round of applause to our to our presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, uh, Stephen, I think you can conclude this recording and we'll just get a little, I mean, not that this is an already pretty loose conversation, but we'll, we can get off the record, I suppose, and, uh, and say, with anybody needs to leave, certainly we understand uh, our uh, time limitation already has, but thank you all. But let's, uh, let's continue for anybody that's uh, still uh, open with their time. Yeah, and let me be. Let me once again thank um, uh, Sue and Beth and Joe for stepping in. And yes, Joe, I, I owe you early morning coffee. And I know that you guys have, have a lot. So if you can't stick around, certainly understood. So otherwise, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for having me. But unfortunately, yeah, I have a another meeting uh, starting actually supposed to be started three minutes ago. So I have <laughs> right. to excuse myself. Okay, but. Uh, Bye, Thank everyone. you so much. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. Okay.